I want to read to you, I want to teach to you from uh, a passage called John, uh, John chapter 10, uh, entitled The Good Shepherd. And I, as I read it to you, I, I, I'm aware that most of us, none of us, almost none, almost none of us have uh, any experience in sheep farming. And so this is a kind of unfamiliar, uh, maybe a couple, um, this is a, it's a largely an unfamiliar idea to us. And it probably feels a little bit twee, you know, you kind of have a picture of a shepherd kind of holding on some lambs, and it feels very kind of um, Disney-esque, I suppose. But I want to suggest to you, really, this is ultimately this, a statement of leadership. This is Jesus saying loudly and clearly, I am the rightful authority in your life. I am the rightful authority in your life. And don't try, as I read to you, I don't want you to try and construct one picture here. It's actually at least two pictures uh, but rather see it as a series of, of metaphorical statements that Jesus is using, this picture of a shepherd, to tell us something about what it means that he is the rightful master of your life. It'll be on the screen behind me. There are some Bibles at the back if you want to grab one. I'm going to read to you from John chapter 10, verse 1 to 21. Truly, truly, I say to you, He who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he's brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep Follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, and the metaphor slightly switches here, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door, the gate, so to speak. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own. My own know me. Just as, I, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, But I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I received from my father. There was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, He has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, These are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Just before this passage, Jesus has miraculously opened the eyes of a blind man. I want you to imagine for a moment a playground, a busy playground with lots of kids. It's the end of the school day, and all the kids are playing. And the first parents have arrived to pick up their children, and two mums come into the playground, are chatting together. And one mum uh, it's just chatting to the other mum, and out of the kind of corner of her child's ear, her little six-year-old daughter, Maddie, playing in the corner of the playground, she hears her mum talking to another mum. And, and amidst all the bustle and hustle and all the activity of the playground, 
she makes a beeline for her mum. She goes straight to her. She's, she said, this is my mum. There's a joy welling up in her heart. She's delighted, probably cries out, mummy, that kind of thing. And then the next day, a stranger comes into the playground. Someone she doesn't know it makes a beeline for her and says, Maddie, come here, Maddie, come here. And what's her response? Well, like any good six or seven-year-old, she's been taught well. She knows, stranger danger, and she runs away. <laughs> she goes and tells the teacher. And that response, that, that kind of difference of response is, is what Jesus is describing in this story. He's describing, um, in the first few verses, a picture. You can imagine a, 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 a settlement, a community of different houses that are maybe perhaps distantly related in familial terms, and they all back on to the same courtyard. And in that courtyard, there is a pen of a multitude of sheep from different flocks. Each family has their own flock of sheep. It's an agricultural community. They each uh, look after a group, a group of sheep. It's their livelihood. And uh, in the morning, you can imagine, uh, each family sends a, a, their shepherd to that pen, that group, that multitude of sheep, and the gatekeeper recognizes them, and he opens the door, and his sheep recognize his voice. They know him. They've, they've spent many hours with that shepherd out. He's led them to good pasture. They, they trust him. They know he's good for them, and so they follow him, and so he leads them out. In the Middle East, the, the shepherding, the, the kind of the shepherd would lead the sheep. They hear his voice, and they follow him. But they won't follow a stranger. They won't follow anybody else. And what you've got to see really is that Jesus is painting a paradigm of the Christian life here. Behind this, these metaphors, Jesus is really describing what it means to be a Christian. Christians are like these sheep. As kind of bizarre as that sounds, they are those who've heard Jesus calling them. In fact, he says calling them by name, who have heard the Christian message and it has taken root in their lives. It's, they said, he is speaking to me. This is true. This is real. He has gripped my heart in some way. So they are men and women under authority. Just as the sheep go and obey their shepherds, so too the Christian has said, Effectively, Jesus, you are my master. You are my Lord. And where you go, I will go. I will follow you. Maybe some of you here as Christians, kind of that, that almost feels a little bit jarring. Well, as we, enter, as we have a baptism this morning, it's actually a kind of moment for you to remember that reality. You know, if you ever be to a wedding, I'm a married man. We've married about seven years, I think. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, we'll do, yes, it's seven years. Um, and, uh, and when we go to weddings, <laughs> I don't have lots of... I don't, basically, when you go to these weddings, you, there's a moment when you're watching the, the couple make a promise to each other. And in that moment, you remember the promises that you've made to your spouse. It's kind of a, a moment of kind of all re-entering into that marriage commitment that we've made, those of us who are married at that wedding. Maybe that's just me, but that's how I feel when I go to a wedding. And I suspect, I want to suggest to you that actually as you watch a baptism, the same thing is going on as a Christian. Because as you watch these three young men um, each declare their allegiance to Christ, as you watch them each kind of make that commitment to obey him and to go wherever he goes to follow him, we are reminded that we too made those promises once upon a time. That we share that same commitment and allegiance. We too, like that child and like that sheep, we trust and obey Jesus. Not in a kind of simplistic way, like every day we wake up in the morning and we're saying, what, what's Jesus' message for me today? But in a sense of, I'm a man or woman under authority. Jesus is my Lord. He's my leader. He's my master. And I am his follower. And yet as I present that idea to you, as you see this picture of a shepherd and a sheep, I suspect there are some of you who are repulsed by such an idea. That this feels deeply alien and anti-ethical to the spirit of our age. We live in a profoundly individualistic culture. The mantra of our culture is, I am the master of my own life. I need no shepherd, no master, no leader. I will make the decisions for myself. You may have heard of the poem Invictus by William Henley, popularized by Nelson Mandela. 
in the last line, he says, I am the master of my own fate, the captain of my own soul. Many of you will resonate with that and say, this idea that Christ would be the shepherd, the leader of my life, is utterly at odds with my deepest instincts. And I would have agreed with you. When I was 18 years old, I was in a Baptist church, and I didn't grow up in a Christian family, I'm from a Jewish secular family, and I remember a moment when they kind of said, put up your hand in a kind of excited way, put up your hand if Jesus is your Lord, or Jesus is something like that. And I just remember thinking, absolutely not. Like, I, I was drawn to the person of Christ in some way. I'd kind of started to read about him. And I, I think probably if you pushed me, I would have said, yeah, I think he is who he said he is. And yet, the idea that he would be master of my life, well, that would clash with every dream and purpose that I have for myself. That would get in the way of all my plans. And when my plans contradict his plans, I knew whose plans I wanted to follow. I suspect many of you are in that kind of place. You say, why would anyone submit themselves to Christ like a young child follows their parent. Or like these baptism candidates are kind of going to be this living embodiment of these sheep following the shepherd. Even the word sheep in our culture, it's, it's, it, it, it speaks of a herd animal who follows everybody else. You say, I'm not a sheep. Of course, I think I would say you're more like a sheep than you realize. You know, think about the beginning of the pandemic, how everyone started buying toilet paper. There was no, there was no shortage at the beginning but then everybody, some people started buying toilet paper and suddenly I better do it because everybody else is doing it. Or actually you could go much worse and say mo the moments of worst genocide in human history. They say, why does the whole population do such evil things? It's because everybody else is doing it. So it's okay. We are herd creatures as human beings. We measure our behavior by the people around us and, and they tell us what's acceptable or not. And in fact, here's the rub. Some of you sitting here who look at this and say, I could never be a sheep of Christ, so to speak. I could never submit myself to him are saying it because you are a sheep like creature and you've been born in an individualistic age that has taught you to say I will, be, I will let no one be my master. So the very reason that you're presenting that you won't let Christ be your Lord is actually because you are like a sheep. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> Good, I'm glad it made sense to some of you. <laughs> so why? That's the question we've got to answer this morning. Why would anyone do this? <laughs> Most of the people in this room, why would they do this? And the answer is really simple. It's trust. They trust him. That's the difference between the, the stranger and the shepherd or the stranger and the parent in the little picture I gave you. The difference is the sheep don't trust the, the stranger. They trust the shepherd. They know him. The Christian says, I've, I've seen Christ in the Gospels. I've seen him at work in my life. I've seen his sacrifice for me. I've seen his character. And so I say, I'll follow you. It's the wisest thing I can do. John Maxwell, a leadership expert, said, trust is the foundation of leadership. Trust is the foundation of leadership. And you know that as soon as trust is lost in politics or work or any other part of society, the minute they, that person can't lead the people if they don't trust them. And so it follows then, if, if someone's a follower of Christ, they've, they've, they've said, I trust him. He is worth following. And that is precisely, by the way, what Jesus is saying in this passage. When he says, I am the good shepherd, a better, perhaps a better way of translating it, because good is one of those words that just means everything. It's like nice. What is it? It's so, you overuse so much, we don't even know what it means. But the word kalos in Greek could perhaps better be translated, the worthy shepherd. The worthy shepherd or the noble shepherd. Christ is saying, look at me, look at my life, look at my death, and you will see that I am the only one who is worthy to be master of your life, to lead you. That is Christ's claim, and I want to show you uh, why. By the way, just out of pure historical curiosity, you should want to answer this question. How was this wandering Jewish teacher who walked the, a, a relative Roman backwater, Galilee and Israel, not a prominent place, how was he able to convince so many people to make him the master of their lives? In fact, to go further, he makes the even more outrageous claim. A few verses later, in verse 33 of this story, the, they, they want to stone him. They get out their stones to stone him. Why? Because he has committed blasphemy. He doesn't just claim to be the good shepherd. He makes the claim to be God in the flesh. They can't stand it. Say, how are you, are you, a mere man, to claim to be God? 
Jesus makes the most incredible claim. No other religious leader, in prominent religious leader in history, Muhammad, Buddha, Guru Nanak, you know, whoever it is, whatever religion, the prominent religious leaders of history never make the same claim as Jesus. Never make the same claim that they are God in the flesh. Why was Jesus, who made such an incredible claim, who made such an incredible statement of mastery, of lordship over your life, why was he able to convince so many people to follow him? And I want to show you the answer from this text. By the way, this actually speaks also to those of you who are Christians. Because the problem is it's not just enough just to intellectually assent to the notion that Jesus is the good shepherd. You've heard this many times before, and you go, yes, it's a a comforting, nice, twee image. But what you've got to realize is the way we know whether you believe this or not is the fruit in your life. You show whether you believe this by what, what your life looks like. The sheep listen to his voice. The sheep are those who are eager to hear the words of Christ. If you rarely open your Bible, then you know that that's not you. Are you eager to hear the voice of Christ? Do you long to hear him speaking into your life? He knows the sheep and they know him. Is Christ, uh, do you know Christ? Do you know the character? Do you know the depth of his teaching? Or is he a kind of shadowy figure at the edge of your life? Maybe just a a body on the cross. Like a kind of vague outline, but no detail. Have you allowed his teaching to sink into your heart, to see the very essence of who he is? Are you familiar with him like you might be familiar with what your friends say? You know, you've got, you've got a good friend and you know them well and you're having a discussion. You're like, I know what you're going to say. We've had this discussion 10 times before and, and you could say it for them. If, uh, maybe just me who has long-standing arguments with my dear friends. Um, <laughs> we've, we've all had this argument before. My point is, that, that for a Christian, I think it's something like that. Actually, when, you, when, when, when Jesus speaks into your life, you say, I, I know this wisdom. I'm, I'm familiar with this voice. I've welcomed this voice and, I, and, I've, and I've heard it. He's like a friend to me. Do you know him like that? And that really the ultimate test is, do you obey him? The whole point here is that the sheep follow him out of the sheep pen and go with him. That They follow him to the good pasture. The ultimate test of whether you believe Jesus is the good shepherd is whether you obey him. And here's the rub. It's not as simple as just Jesus' voice speaking to you. Imagine for a moment you're in this sheep pen and Jesus is coming to you saying, come, follow me. And in that moment, it's not just Jesus' voice. You've got the the world, so to speak, coming up, personified, saying, come this way. You know that desire in your heart? You know that feeling that you feel? It's really good, and you should keep doing it. You should keep going after it. And and Jesus is saying, no, 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 come this way. And the world is calling out to you, saying, no, come this way. And maybe your inner inner desires are, are calling out a third way. And there's a kind of cacophony of different voices. And in the midst of the cacophony of different voices, the contested space that this world is... It's not a Christian world, it's a, it's a largely secular society. There are all sorts of voices, all sorts of, dare I say, thieves and robbers who will come to you promising much. You have the challenge as a Christian to hear the voice of Christ and to follow him. And that you'll only do that if you trust him. So just as we would say to someone who's not a Christian here, I want to show you why Jesus is trustworthy, to the Christian I want to say, I want to show you why Jesus is trustworthy, to remind you of why his voice is the only voice worth listening to. So first, I want to give you three reasons. Think about who who he is and what he did. First of all, he laid down his life. The dominant reason that Jesus gives to show you that he is worthy to be the master of your life, the guru, the leader, is that he loves you so much that he was willing to die for you in stark contrast to the leaders of his era and of ours. You see, Jesus makes a point of his sacrificial death a number of times in this passage. He goes on, mentioning it four times, at least by my count. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Verse 15, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Verse 17, for this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. Verse 18, 
I'm not doing this for anybody else. I'm doing this because I want to. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Why is Jesus so keen for us to see the prominence of his death as a basis for why we should trust him, that he is that worthy or good shepherd? Now, the problem here when we talk about the cross is there's a great problem of overfamiliarity. Why? Because the cross is probably the most, I'd say definitely the most recognizable religious symbol in all of the world today. I'd possibly suggest it might be one of the most recognized, if not the most recognized symbol in all, in all of society. The cross. But just think about the bizarreness of that for a moment. The cross is a method of Roman execution, an evil painful method of execution such that Cicero, the great Roman orator, said it is the most miserable and painful punishment appropriate only for slaves. It's so so gruesome, so unattractive, Cicero is saying, that actually Roman citizens, you know, the kind of top elite of the society, the normal, the people who have the right of citizenship... They, they, shouldn't, they certainly can't be killed by crucifixion. They shouldn't even think about it. This is, just think about for a moment the, the incongruity of this. That this awesome method of death and torture is the most recognized sim, religious symbol in the world today. Isn't that a fascinating idea? It's like as if, imagine, all the way around the world, you just walk around and you just saw people carrying a kind of electric chair on, on a... On a, on a um, on a, on a pendant, <laughs> like, or, or a hangman's noose. On the, you know, you just think, what are you? Who are you? What kind of mad butcher are you that you would feel comfortable to have a method of death hanging from your neck? And that's, that's the world today, ladies and gentlemen. Why? Why does Jesus' death feature so highly in his thinking? Why is it so significant that it has become this dominant symbol in our culture? Why does this, you've got to remember how shameful and humiliating this is, by the way. It's, a, it's got more in common with a, a lynching than any kind of 21st century method of, 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 of death, like a kind of, you know, uh, the, syringe, the kind of injection, lethal injection, nothing like that. This is gruesome. Christ is hung naked on a tree. Why does he make such a big deal of the, his future intended destiny? And what you've got to see here is his, his motive. There's two things, actually. There's the effect. We'll come back to that. But the motive. He's saying, the reason you can trust me is that I am doing this for you. I am the good shepherd who sacrificed, who laid down his life. Who for? For the sheep. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. This is not some act of impersonal martyrdom. He does it for the people he loves. He does it for the people who will call him Lord one day. This is an act of loving self sacrifice. Notice he makes this contrast between the hired hand in verse 12 and 13. He says, the hired hand is looking after the sheep, but you know that a wolf comes and his life is threatened. And he says, actually, I'm just going to go because you know, I'd rather, rather care about my own life. And so you know what? I'll lose the sheep because I'll just scarper because I don't really care about the sheep. The implication Jesus is making is I am the good shepherd who stays with the sheep to the end. I am willing to lay down my life for them. Why? Because I love them. And this kind of love, love it again, it's one of those words that is overused in our society. So you might say, lots of love as you wave someone goodbye and don't really care about them. That kind of thing, let's be honest. I'm not talking about... <laughs> I'm just going to stop here now. Um, <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a great contrast between the kind of love he's talking about. Actually, the love that he's describing is much more like the love of a parent. Because Jesus says, why? Why do I do this? Because the sheep are my own. In verse 14, he says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. He's speaking of one who says, these sheep are mine. This is a declaration of saying, you are mine. Jesus is saying that to every person here. Whether you're a Christian or you're not, Jesus is saying, you are mine, and I loved you so much that I was willing to die for you. That is the kind of love. The kind of love that doesn't really make sense. <laughs> Just think for a moment, if you're walking down the street and you're, and you're walking across the street and you don't see it and a car is about to hit you and someone you don't know runs in front and knowingly pushes you out of the way and takes it, dies, dies for you. In that moment, you, for, for days, months, perhaps even years afterwards, you would just be scratching your head. You'd be saying, what on earth possessed that person to lay down their life for me? 
And what about if you found out that the person who laid down their life for you <laughs> knows everything about you? knows every little detail of your life, knows your worst indiscretions and your, the way you treat the people you love in your worst moments, aka not well. They see the reality of what's going on in your life that nobody else sees, and yet they still loved you. And that is what the Bible describes as the love of God. In, um, in Romans chapter 5, uh, Paul, one of the uh, teachers of the New Testament, makes this point to describe the love of God and how just utterly bizarre it is to our ears. He said, while we were weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person. There might be, the kind of pe- there might be a few people out there who would say, I would die for them, I'd take a bullet for them because they are of the kind of character that deserves it. So perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God knows everything about you and he was still willing to send his son to die for you. Christ is driven to the cross. The whole gospel, almost half the gospel accounts are are the last week focused entirely on his death. And we see Jesus walking towards the cross, going through betrayal and a kang- being brought before a kangaroo court of Jewish authorities on trumped-up charges and slandering his name. And we see again and again Jesus walking through these really awful moments and think, what is driving him against, against the odds? And the answer is love. Jesus is driven to the cross out of love. Why? Because he wants to be reconciled. He says there is a great fissure, so a great breakage between man and God, and Christ goes to the cross to take the penalty that humanity deserves so that we might be reconciled. You don't need to understand all all about that yet at the moment. What you need to know is that the cross is an act of love, an act of reconciliation love, that God wants to be united with you, wants you in his family, and so he's willing to die for you. And this is what makes Jesus' leadership so distinctive. The reason why Christians can say we trust him is because we've encountered a love that is better than life. We've encountered a leader who is of perfect moral excellence. And so we say, actually, the very best thing I can do is give my life and trust you. Oh, it's a pigeon. Um, Napoleon makes, uh, Napoleon makes, makes a statement to, to contrast Jesus' love and... Um, and, his, and, and, and really every other kind of military hero in history. He says, I know men, and I tell you, Jesus Christ was not a man. Superficial minds might see a resemblance between Christ and the founders of empires and the gods of other religions. That resemblance does not exist. There is between Christianity and other religions the distance of infinity. Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne and myself founded empires. But on what did we rest the creations of our genius? Upon sheer force. There have been empires. Men, women, millions of people have made acts of devotion towards leaders in history. Almost always it's because of force, because of strength. But he says, no, Jesus is different. Jesus Christ alone founded his empire upon love. And at this hour, millions of men will die for him. We follow Christ because his love has captured our hearts. It's not drudgery. We say, because of his love, I know he's got our best interests at heart. Compare this with the thieves and the robbers. Jesus is keen to say, look, I'm not like these other leaders. And he, I think he's at least primarily talking about the leaders of his day. And actually, if you go through the Gospels, you see there is a great contrast between the moral beauty of Christ and the, quite frankly, evil that we see in the leaders around him. Think about Herod, the king, when Jesus arrives. He's, he's got this great palace seated on a, on a kind of mountain top. When he hears that there's a Messiah coming, he commits genocide and he kills the babies, the baby boys, because he's so threatened by the idea of one other leader who might come up, who is a promised Jewish king. That's, that's, that's human leadership, leading out of self-interest, leading out of a desire to maintain power. That's not the leadership of Christ. No, the leadership of Christ is of giving of oneself all the way to the point where he gives his life on the cross. 
This is a be- there's a beautiful moment in the Gospels when you see this in crystal clear clarity. Mark chapter 15, Jesus is delivered before Pilate, the Roman leader. And in that moment, uh, Jesus is standing there, basically silent. And, and, and you've got these different actors. You've got the crowd who are baying for Jesus' blood. They're saying, crucify him, crucify him. There's a sense of bloodthirsty stupidity, quite frankly. You think they don't, they've got nothing against this guy. He's done nothing really against the crowd, but they've been whipped up into a kind of frenzy of, of, of stupid aggression, basically. So you've got the crowd there. Then you've got the Pharisees, who Pilate, the Roman leader, can see have brought Jesus there on trumped-up charges out of self-interest. Why? Because they are threatened by him. So they are acting out of self-interest. They're saying, basically, we've got to get this guy out of here, we've got to kill him, so we can be in charge, so that the relig- so our religion and our, our ways are not threatened by this man. So the Pharisees are there, driven out of self-interest. The mob is there out of a kind of crude, ignorant, violent th- uh, fury. And even Pilate himself, Pilate can see Jesus has done nothing wrong, and yet he washes his hands. He does it, why? Because of political expediency. He says, you know what, I want to keep these Jews on side, so the best thing I can do is assent to the murder, to the crucifixion of an innocent man, driven by self-interest again. And when you hear, these are the thieves and the robbers that Jesus is talking about. He's saying, look at those leaders. They don't care about you. They are willing to kill people to maintain power. If that was true of the leaders of their day, perhaps not in the same extreme sense in our day, but I think they stand as a kind of model for our, our society. That actually, in a way, doesn't this speak to the great longing in the hearts of so many in our culture for a leader who we can trust? For leaders who we can trust. The reason why so many of us react so viscerally against the notion that Christ would be the master and Lord and leader of our lives is because we've grown up in a profoundly individualistic culture. And the reason we're in that culture is because we have witnessed the failure of authority after authority after authority. Abuse scandals in the media and in the church and in politics and you know just look at the news headlines this last week of examples of leaders who are using their power to gratify their sexual desires we're so used to this that we just kind of take it for granted the idea that someone is in leadership we assume they're doing it for some kind of self-interested motive that's just normal to us Or these thieves and the robbers who come to steal, kill, and destroy. Isn't the 21st century littered with examples of those who were maybe portrayed themselves as liberators, but when they came to power, they became dictators and oppressors. And they did exactly that. They stole, they killed, and destroyed life. Genocidal leaders, Stalin, Mao, Pol Pot. History is littered with these thieves and robbers that Jesus is describing Our culture is littered, perhaps, with either thieves and robbers or at least those who are hired hands who say, when when things get tough, I'm going to leave. They're not the same, the leaders of the same moral character as Christ. When we look at Jesus, we see the man who spoke the wisest words of human history, but won't waste words on those who won't listen, who's able to withstand the greatest injustice with great courage and even forgive the greatest betrayal by his closest friends who has compassion on the last, the least, and the lost, and yet is strong in his opposition to evil, without being brash or stupid or proud, who has such a a love for the rebellious people who will eventually kill him that at one point he breaks down in tears for the city of Jerusalem, who's of such moral purity in his thought life. He's the same uh, in his words, and he's the same with his friends as he is with the crowd, a man of great integrity. When you look at Christ in the Gospels, when you see his moral purity, we cannot but worship him. So who is this noble shepherd? Who is this wise shepherd, the one who stands above all other leaders? But we can also speak to what? I want to touch on these two points. Really, ultimately, it's not just who he is, It's that he is able to give life. Christ is the only worthy shepherd because he alone can give spiritual life, who can reverse the decay at the heart of humanity and bring you into life and flourishing forever. And no other leader, even the best human leader, 
And there are those among them, there are good leaders. I'm not saying that all leaders are thieves and robbers. Even the best human leader cannot match Christ's offer of this life that he brings. At the center of this passage, Jesus makes the point that he comes to bring life. It says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. And I have come that they may have life and life in abundance. In fact, he goes further and says, I am the door. I am the way. I am the only way to life. It says, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and he will go in and out and find pasture. He's saying, I am the only way to life and flourishing. The source of true life. The only way this makes sense is you accept the radical proposition that you are dead. And on a minute you say, I am not dead. And we've talked about this the last couple of weeks, so I won't dwell on this too long. But actually, Jesus is making the claim that it's not talking primarily here about a physical death, but he's talking about a spiritual death. Saying, ultimately, human beings were made for a relationship with God. And that he is the source of all life. Right at the beginning of John's gospel, he says, in the sun there was life and light. Life. The source of the life that human beings need is found in God. And as we've ruptured ourselves from God, as we've rejected him and rejected his authority, we have taken ourselves away from that life. A bit like how you might take a laptop and rip it from the power adapter. And slowly the battery's declining and after a while it doesn't work so well. And you know that it's headed towards complete finish. That is a kind of metaphor and a picture for what humanity is without God. Like a laptop that is losing its charge and is ultimately going to die. The Bible says human beings are in a state of death. And you might say, well, what does this spiritual death mean? What do we mean by that? Well, there's a few ways we can see that. But first of all, we can see a moral decay at the heart of humanity. Saying so at the very core of every human being is a kind of rottenness, a sickness, this is what the Bible calls sin. It's, uh, it speaks of the, the out of the heart. It's not problem, the problem isn't with the systems or the education or even the culture, although those things can all be broken. It says, no, the problem of humanity is a problem of the heart. Out of the heart comes all sorts of evil, all sorts of evil desires that show there is a kind of spiritual deadness in the heart of every human being. Jesus said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him, what makes him ugly, so to speak. For, for from within, out of the heart of man, out of the inner person, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. Incidentally, until you recognize this inner sickness, this sense of moral failure, you cannot come to Christ. He says, I come for the, not for the healthy, but for those who know they are sick. And actually, of the three testimonies we're here today, each one of them came face to face with their own moral failure in their own way as part of their journey towards Christ. So we see it in a kind of spiritual death, in the moral sickness inside each one of us. We also see it in the problem of physical death. Actually, it's staring us right in the face that we don't see it, but, the, but it's a bit like, you know when someone's struggling with anxiety, it might come out in all sorts of physical ways. This spiritual death that humanity experiences manifests itself ultimately in our physical death. Our physical death is a kind of consequence of this spiritual death inside each human being. It's a sign that there's something deeply wrong. We know that when we look at death. It troubles us. That's why we don't talk about it, because it's such an evil idea that one day your existence will come to an end. It, it carries a kind of shadow that cover, uh, kind of covers our, our culture. We live in the shadow of death, anxi- health anxiety, the fear of, of our body, something going wrong with our body is because we're ultimately fearful of death. The fact that it's, it's like um, in the Harry Potter books, the, it's, it's a thing that, that no one talks about. Like they talk, don't talk about Voldemort because he's so evil and so scary. Death is that thing we don't talk about. It's the thing we push to the margins of society because it strikes fear into our heart. And this, the Bible says, is actually a consequence of that spiritual death, that separation from God. And the third way I'd pro- I want to show you why that spiritual death is real is see the life in someone who comes to Christ, who, where the laptop a charger is... is 
connected back to the laptop, so to speak. You see, each of these men, their stories, you're going to hear, as they came to Christ, their lives were changed. They're still broken human beings, I think, by their, they're all great guys, by the way, but they were the st- <laughs> they're still flawed, but each one of them can point to ways in which Jesus is changing them, to which they've seen the life of Christ at work in them, that his life has brought a change of desire, change of mental state, change of, of inner, the inner man, that then has changed all their behavior in all sorts of ways. That is a sign that the life of Christ makes a difference. So here we have the reality, the, the, the kind of judgment, of the, do, the, the diagnosis of death. This is why the notion that Jesus brings life is so magnificent. Because he says, in the face of the reality of this broken and sick humanity, and in the face of the reality of the physical death, we know one who has conquered death. It's very easy to miss this. But Jesus makes this point in this passage, in John chapter 10. He says, for this reason... The Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. And in verse 18, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down and the authority to take it up again. It's easy to miss what he's talking about there, but what he's talking about is the fact that three days after his death, Christ was resurrected. This is not a, a metaphorical idea, a kind of nice idea that Christians use to comfort themselves. It says the historical reality is that Christ came back to life. That he proved that he was no mere man, that he was who he said he is, God in the flesh. Now this sounds historically implausible. Dead men don't rise. And that's in a way the point. That's the thing that shows us he's distinctive. But actually if you look at the evidence, I think there's so much there to prove that it's the, mo- it's the thing that makes sense of the, da- the data. When you see the way the disciples were transformed, they went from a cowering bunch of people to being willing to spread the message of Christ around the Roman Empire, to go to the people who killed their Lord. What explains that transformation? What explains the fact that the church explodes after his death? Most people, after they die, their movements shrink. Jesus has a a small movement while he's living, but after he dies, it explodes against the odds. Millions of people come to follow him while it's an illegal cult. They can lose their lives for it, but they're willing to do it. Why? Because some of them, a group of them, a small group of eyewitnesses, saw him alive. They were transformed by this fact. Psychologists have written off the notion that it's kind of... um, What's the word? Uh, Psychologists will rule out the notion of a kind of uh, collective hallucination. Thank you, Ed Kessie. Um, <laughs> just, just there, thank you. Um, the, the, win- the eyewitness of testimonies have a kind of ring of authenticity about them. The women are the ones who see Jesus resurrected. And in those days, women couldn't even be a... Uh, go on, help me out again. Uh, I, <laughs> a, a testimony, a witness in a court of law. Such was the patriarchy of the day, women couldn't even give evidence in a court. But yet the Bible says that women were the first witnesses of the resurrection. The, new, the gospel accounts are full of all sorts of inconvenient truths that, that wouldn't be there if you were making it up. And yet we come round to the unlikely, but I think absolutely convincing conclusion that Jesus died and rose again. And in, in rising again, he punched through death, he defeated death, not just for himself, but all who believe in him will have eternal life, will live with God for eternity. And then you compare him to every other human leader and even the best are nothing compared to this conquering hero who promises he will come back to judge the living and the dead. You know, the best we can do as human beings is impotently rage against the dying of the light. We can provide some kind of comfort when we're struggling. We can try and bring some sort of moral improvement. The gurus of this life will give you that. They will give you moral improvement or they'll give you comfort but they cannot solve the brass tacks of the matter. They cannot deal with the great intruder that is death and the despair that comes with it. But Christ can. That's why he's worthy. Thirdly, he's worthy because the life he's offering is a rich and satisfying life. When Christ promises life, he's not simply describing physical endurance forever. He's describing being united with the source of all life. And that satisfies your deepest longings. When Christ offers eternal life, it's life with God. It's not just phys- like living forever. It's living with the one who made you. And it's that life with God that satisfies our deepest desires. This is not some sort of prosperity preaching. 
Of course, you will suffer in all sorts of ways as a follower of Christ, and these three may have already experienced some of that. But it says, without Christ, you'll never be fully satisfied. And with Christ, you experience the satisfaction of your deepest longings. Don't you see that modern man is experiencing a crisis of dissatisfaction? Do you see our culture is richer and, wealth and has more opportunities and more holidays and all the things that we thought would make us happy, and yet there's that lingering sense of dissatisfaction in our culture? Darren Brown, who's not a Christian, says, we look for happiness in all the places that are supposed to offer it, but parties have a happy habit of being disappointing, and the promotion or the new car does not quite yield the joy we expected. The places and things that insist most loudly that they will make us happy rarely do. We experience the disappointment of success. The very things we hoped for don't satisfy us. And that's, it's not because dissatisfaction is, is a wrong thing to want. It's written into our wiring as human beings. It's that we're looking in the wrong places. The primary source of satisfaction we're looking for is God himself. It explains our dissatisfaction. We experience anxiety in this day, in our cultural moment, in this cultural moment, because we live as orphans with no notion of a father in heaven who loves us and who's in control of the universe and will bring about his plans for our life. That is what you're meant to live under, but we divorce ourselves from that truth, and so we experience anxiety. We experience loneliness because we were made for a relationship with a God who loves us and wants to satisfy us with his love, but we've divorced ourselves from the deepest source of love in our life. We're meant to live with hope. We all want to have hope for the future, and yet we live in despair because we live in a uni- a world with a worldview that says there is no fundamental hope. We're just headed towards destruction. Or even we experience a purposelessness in our culture, going from job to job or city to city, looking for something to attach ourselves to because we've ripped any sense of purpose out of the universe by taking away the God who made you, who has a purpose for your life. See, faith in Christ connects with our deepest longings. As you come to Christ, you experience a freedom from anxiety as you come to know the Father in heaven who loves you and cares for you. As you come to Christ, you no longer experience a a crushing sense of despair at the state of the world. Yes, you see evil and suffering. You're grieved by it, but you know that Christ is coming back to bring about a resurrection and a transformation of the broken world. When you come to Christ, you're no longer wishing and longing and grasping around for a purpose because you find your purpose from the God who made you. So I want you this morning to hear Christ's invitation to life to a life with him for eternity, to a life that breaks through and punches through death, but a life that is rich and satisfying. In verse 16, he says, I have other sheep from this flock. He's saying, look, there are others out there who don't know me, and yet I'm calling them to come under my shepherding. Turn away from those thieves and robbers. The sin that's kept you away from Christ doesn't love you. The world and all she offers is a fickle mistress. Come to Christ and receive rest for your souls. John chapter 7, Jesus stands up at the end of a feast and he says, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Jesus is saying, if you are thirsty, if you recognize some sense of you lack this life, this sense of dissatisfaction, the moral decay within your heart. Jesus says, come to me and drink. Come and receive the life that is in me, the life that I have. That is what Christ's invitation to every person. Come under my leadership and let me be the shepherd of your life. 